Hey everyone, it's me Hawkeye G and I'm here with another video for you. This time I'm doing a video on the Chaos Dwarves and explaining all the various elements of their resource economy mechanics. With this new DLC coming out, I figure there's going to be a lot of questions and based on my early access experience, it's a complicated system. We'll be talking about how to obtain each type of resource, how to spend it, and what some common mistakes are to avoid. I'll start by going through each resource individually and talking about how each one of them works, and then I'll be going over some general rules that I think can apply as well. With that being said, let's get into the information. We're now going to talk about labor. Now, labor, again, like I said, it's not really a resource in the same way as the others. Labor isn't something you produce, it's something you acquire. You get labor from captives taken after a battle. You need that labor in order to supply your workload, which is how you get your raw materials output. Um, it's important to have. You can also use it to get these kind of temporary bonuses, whether you trade it in for conclave influence or money real quick, or you use it to gain um, public order bonus in that province for a while. So it's kind of how much you have is dictated by how much battle you're doing. You can sack or raise enemy settlements in order to get a lot of labor from them. Obviously fighting battles, you can get them and there's a post battle loot option for additional labor. Um, and you can see it also decreases every turn, like it says, based on your control levels. So the better control you have, the less labor you lose per turn, which is kind of nuts, um, but it helps kind of balance itself out. But the point being, um, just something to keep in mind. Labor is something that can kind of slip away from you if you're not paying enough attention. And so it's important to keep track of you can also get it from the convoy system. We actually don't have an example of it here, which is crazy, but you can spend gold to acquire labor through the convoy system. Now, the next piece we are going to look at is our raw materials. Raw materials are a central resource for the Chaos Dwarves. The two main features of them are that they provide for building upgrades and then they are turned into armaments. You get them by creating the outpost settlement type and then making the mine building chain, which produces raw materials in exchange for a workload requirement. So we just talked about labor. These have a workload requirement and you can see that even the first tier of it has a pretty steep workload requirement. As we go up the ranks, the ratio of raw materials output to workload required gets better. The costs are still pretty steep though. It's a big commitment for every new building in terms of laborers. So something to keep in mind, especially in the early game. Now you need a lot of raw materials for your various buildings. The first one is your towers. Your capital settlement building doesn't require any growth points. It only requires raw materials to upgrade. Obviously this is an important one and the higher level this is, the more conclave influence you get per turn, which is another resource. So raw materials can be turned into conclave influence. Raw materials are also used in your capital settlement for any of your infrastructure building. And you can see there's the little icon right next to it here. So early on, we're getting gold and public order from that. We can eventually get Lord recruit rank and hero recruit rank faction wide. We can get additional conclave influence through the Temple of Hashut. And we can also get a reduction of raw materials consumed per turn by buildings. This would be more for your factory designated provinces. Raw materials are also used to upgrade the factory settlement chain buildings. And additionally, they're used for the infrastructure buildings that a factory would use to produce things as well. So these are just as important as any other settlement building, and armament production is critical in this campaign. Speaking of armament production, you need raw materials to do just that. In order to produce armaments, you incur a raw materials upkeep each turn. So we can see here, for example, for 200-ish raw materials per turn, we generate 100 armaments. This is only done at these factory type province or settlements. These settlements can also convert raw materials into money. And it, but it does, it feels a little expensive to me, but that is still a really good rate. However, it's not quite the same as just spending money to get a money producing building. Um, but as you can see at 250 gold maximum here, versus 750 maximum gold here. It's pretty, If it's much more efficient to convert raw materials into gold to get gold than it is to just make a gold building, at least for the Chaos Dwarves. The big thing is that this cost for getting armaments out of raw materials isn't super steep right away, and the amount of armaments that it generates for you is significant, especially in the early stages of the game. And you can see here we're on turn 46, we're fairly far in and the amount that we're producing versus our upkeep, like a lot of this is coming, for like a single one of these, that gives me 100 per turn. Well, if I have two buildings like this, that's 200 out of my 250 armament upkeep that we have displayed here. 
that is that's almost the entirety that's 80 percent of it from two buildings so we're already we're already talking about armaments here's the official start of that section they are the resource for the chaos dwarfs that centers around their armies and their battles we know already that we get these primarily from converting raw materials in a factory settlement but there are some landmarks and research infrastructure buildings which produce them as well. Now armaments have several uses, but the one we'll see most often is related to our armies. Armaments are used to increase the capacity of any Chaos Dwarf unit that isn't a hobgoblin, laborer, or hero. They are really critical for ensuring your ability to scale up and produce more and stronger armies as you progress throughout the game. In addition, there's this manufactory menu. We can see here on the side, as we increase our total capacity of any unit type, like melee infantry, which we have six total capacity of, at every level, at the levels listed here on the side, when we hit certain totals of unit capacity, we unlock different options in the manufactory. Here in the manufactory, we can then equip these additional abilities to all of our units and give them additional passives. Some of these abilities are very powerful, but the trade-off is that these abilities are unlocked with a per turn and per unit cost. So we can see here my upkeep is 18 armaments per unit, which I have three total units, and so that's 54 armaments per turn that we're spending. The Manufactory is excellent for focusing on one type of unit that you really want to see outperform the rest or use more of, and in later stages of the campaign, of course, being able to have multiple of these equipped is going to increase the strength of your army even further than it already is. Just keep in mind that you have to balance these two systems. The passive upkeep for abilities will interfere with the rate you increase your unit capacity. There's another primary use for the armaments, and that is to upgrade your advanced military buildings. So whenever you make a military advanced military building, and we can see it's got the icon here, these are actually going to cost you armaments to build. Our very best military units are locked behind these upgrades, as are most of our hero capacity upgrades. Some of these buildings have pretty powerful bonuses as well, like global recruit duration minus three for any unit in that region. We can get some pretty good bonuses out of these top tier military buildings as well. It's just another important thing to keep in mind as you progress. You're gonna to wanna to keep a little surplus of armaments instead of immediately spending it on your capacity or using it all at manufactory upkeep. You need a little bit of extra anytime you're gonna upgrade or create advanced military buildings. Now there is one final use for our armaments here. We can actually sell them during the convoys mechanic. And if we look here, we can see the rate of conversion of armaments into gold. Uh, the downside, it, it makes you more money this way than with anything else. The downside is that it's just a one-time deal via, via the caravan. It's not a passive income every turn like all of our other options. It's still important to be aware of, however, as is the best conversion rate for any of your resources. So hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully you appreciate this little side note here uh, because we do still have one more resource to talk about and that is the Conclave influence. I don't see it as being quite the same as the others, perhaps because of how you generate it or perhaps because of how it is spent. We talk, we've mentioned it before, but you mainly get this from your settlement buildings, specifically from your capital settlement building, but you do get one each from your minor settlement buildings. Then there's also the Temple of Hashut building at tier five that you can build to get additional confluence per turn and or conclave influence per turn. And obviously this is the best one at 10 per turn. That's going to be better than anything else that you can get and is going to cost you a lower total of raw materials to achieve that. Outside of other things like landmark buildings, you, you don't really get it uh, from other means. I mean, you can see we don't even get it here, but some other landmarks might have it. In order to spend our council, our conclave influence, it's really only done for one thing, for gaining council seats in the Tower of Jar. When you have enough influence, you purchase one of these council positions and you get the bonus associated with it. I don't want to dive too deep into this mechanic right now. Uh, it might be best to make a separate short video on it instead, but just know that there's lots of bonuses here, and ultimately it's how you confederate the other factions as well. It's an important resource to keep stockpiling, but it's a much more passive acquisition than something like raw materials or armaments. Uh, you basically can't avoid getting it, and it comes to you naturally by expanding, instead of intentionally selecting a settlement type when you've captured a new settlement and then picking the building that will produce the materials. Like, the, the Conclave influence is practically unavoidable, of course, with the exception of the intentionally building the Temple of Hashut. But outside of that, you're just generating it passively. 
So now that we know about the different types of resource we have access to, we can give some general rules for how to apply them in different campaigns. Keep in mind you may not see them appropriately applied in all of the examples I'm about to give, um, but I think it's important to know. First of all, there's two types of minor settlements that you can make as the Chaos Dwarves. These are the outpost and the factory type. Outposts make your raw materials, one of our three resource types. Factories make armaments, another one of our three resource types. Technically, there's a third type of settlement, which is the tower, but this can only be built at the capital at each settlement. A really basic general rule of thumb to follow, especially for the early game. So far, I've had success with a ratio of two outposts producing raw materials in exchange for one factory producing armaments. So two outposts for every one factory. Another thing to keep in mind, factories don't require labor. It's another one of your, it's not really a resource, it's kind of a hidden cost or maintenance upkeep. I don't treat it the same as the other resources in any case, and basically the factories don't require any labor in order to produce their goods. So that's something to keep in mind, especially when setting up entire provinces to be raw material or armament focused. Another tip is to ensure that you have at least one factory in your first three settlements. You'll start with a pretty low baseline of armaments per turn, no matter who you play as. A single tier one armament production building gives you 50 per turn. That is an absolutely massive increase, and a lot of important things are locked away behind armament requirements. So getting one of these by your second or third settlement, I think is really important to do. I'd recommend your third settlement be a factory, and from there you'll have to strike that two to one balance or start dedicating different provinces to different focuses. But it's just, it's important to make sure that in those first, you know, five, ten turns of the game where you're taking your initial settlements, one of those needs to be a factory. Another small thing, each of your settlement building types will generate one conclave influence per turn. So you can see this is kind of more of a passive uh, decision to get that. You don't get it as actively. Um, but just note that your settlements themselves will provide you with that conclave influence. And both types do. Another really simple general rule is to pace yourself on raw material acquisition early on. If we look at the, the mine building, which gives you raw materials, it has a workload requirement. You need to have at least that many laborers in your pool in order to get that full income. Having more laborers reduces your public order. And if you kind of overextend or spread yourself too thin, like, yeah, you need raw materials for a lot of things. But if you try to gather too many too early on, you'll end up just tanking your public order in order to maintain it or you just won't have the laborers to maintain it in the first place. So you can instead focus on income generating buildings, control like public order generating buildings in order to better maintain your empire, expand it further. And then once you've expanded it further, you can afford a better workload. And the last general rule is that each resource tree has its own specific resource that is tied to it and that you'll eventually hit these checkpoints where you need to have some of that resource in order to unlock you know a new section of the tech tree so this is something to keep in mind it, you know every so often you're going to need to save up for this and and it can help kind of dictate you know if you want to focus on certain things or certain types of unlocks certain progress being able to stack those together um, but just just something to keep in mind so that it doesn't catch you off guard and again you can see the three different types have their own separate um, resource research trees that they correspond to. Okay, so that is a lot of general rules. Um, I wanted to just lay out some things that I think are a little bit simpler, more straightforward, give you some general ideas on some basic things that you should know that, that might not specifically fit into other sections. So with that being said, I've covered everything I wanted to for this video. The idea was to give you a detailed breakdown of how to acquire each of the Chaos Dwarfs resources, what they are used for, and how you should approach collecting and balancing them. I hope you've learned some valuable tips about how the Chaos Dwarf economy works and that you can better understand it in your own games in order to find more success in your campaigns. The Chaos Dwarfs have a lot of features to keep track of and balance in your campaigns, so it's important to understand how they all work together. It is definitely not a faction for beginners or for the faint of heart. If you did enjoy the video, please remember to like and subscribe. Let me know you enjoyed the video and keep up with future content from me. If you have any other questions about the Chaos Dwarfs, feel free to answer them. I'm looking to put out more videos on them in the coming weeks as I continue to explore their content. If you have any comments of your own, of course, if you're watching this the day of release, you won't have access to this most likely unless you're one of my fellow content creator friends. But when you do get access and you manage to explore it on your own, please feel